Welcome to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Today, I've got a special guest, uh, Ari Witten, Ari Witten, who is an expert in infrared light and health. Ari, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Peter. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So, what what got you into investigating light? I mean, what you know, it's it's. We look back in time. A lot of people think this is kind of a foo foo, you know, non scientific you know, modality that, you know, weird, crazy quack doctors use in their practices. But, um, you know, there's a lot of science behind this. Where did, where did you get involved in it? I, I was kind of um, into this science before anybody was talking about it. And, you know, I probably 10 years before people started talking about it and it became popular, I was looking at this body of science and going, wow, like this is amazing stuff. I can't believe that people don't know about this. And um, and at that time, no companies existed. And what I was doing is just reading the literature. I was fascinated with understanding the mechanisms. I started thinking of ways that I could um, apply this methodology to my own light. I started with incandescent heat lamps and using those. And then uh, LED technology started to come into existence. And, and basically what I did is I reached out to a company that sold marijuana grow lights. And I said, uh, can you make a custom light for me at, with LEDs of this specific wavelength? And, uh, and they said, yeah. And they sent me one and I used it for a while. And then I started referring some customers to them um, for the same custom lights and tens of people, then hundreds of people. And then eventually the, the owner of the company reached out to me and said, hey, why are you sending all these people to me to order these custom lights at these strange wavelengths? You know, pure, pure red LEDs at 660 nanometers. Can I just ask what you're doing? I have no idea what you're doing. So, you know, I, I was I was sort of on the, the leading edge of that. And then a couple of years later, one of the first companies came out and then subsequently many other companies came out. And then, um, well, actually, I should say two or three companies came out. Then I published my book in 2018. And then I think several dozen companies came into existence after that. Um, so, you know, I've kind of, this has just been as a health geek, something that I found my way into largely as a result of first exploring circadian biology and some of the mechanisms of how light interacts with human biology from that. And then realizing, you know, that light is interacting with mitochondria and exploring that whole story. And then basically just kind of discovering this large body of literature that existed that most of the world didn't know about at that time. I mean, I mean, we think about a lot of times sad seasonal affective disorder as, you know, generally in the winters, especially in northern climates as you know, as being problematic. But, you know, a lot of people don't, I think, don't realize, as you said, that the, the tremendous benefits of light, not just not just ultraviolet, but but red light. Can you talk a little bit about what red light is, where it comes from and um, more more in, in detail as far as the audience who's maybe never heard of red light before? Yeah. So first of all, let me add a bit to your to your context that you were presenting there. It's important to understand that light is bioactive in humans, that there are certain parts of the light spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, let's say to expand it out a bit, that interact with human biology, that do things to our cells. OK, so um, there's a few layers of this. If we if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum more broadly, and I would encourage people to uh, to to look at like do a Google image search for electromagnetic spectrum so they can understand what I'm talking about. But basically what this is, is that on one end of the spectrum, you have things like gamma rays and X rays. So the X rays you get at the doctor's office are part of this electromagnetic spectrum on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and I should say these are very, very short wavelength, very high energy uh, um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We go further, the wavelengths get a bit bigger, they start to get in the nanometer range and the hundreds of nanometers. And then we get into this, a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. And that's the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that the human visual system has evolved to perceive. Okay, and then that helps us navigate our world, obviously, through through our eyes. 
Um, we then get out of the visual, visual spectrum into the infrared part of the spectrum, which is mainly heat. Okay, so when we feel heat coming down on us from the sun, that's primarily the infrared part of the spectrum, specifically more the mid and the far infrared part of the spectrum as the, the wavelengths get longer. Then we get into things like radio waves, which of course we use to listen in our cars to the radio. So that's kind of this landscape of the, this electromagnetic spectrum. But along this, this spectrum, there, there are many parts of this um, of this spectrum that are bioactive in humans, some of which we can perceive with our eyes and some of which we can't. So the, the two layers of the story that most people are familiar with thus far, as far as how they're bioactive, though I would argue also that, that most people only know bits and pieces of this story. Uh, one is the vitamin D story. So most of us have an understanding that we go in the sun sunlight hits our skin specifically the ultraviolet light the ultraviolet part of the spectrum um, only part of which we can perceive with our eyes hits our skin and then leads to the the synthesis of a chemical called vitamin d it's really a hormone actually and it has huge roles in in musculoskeletal health and immune health and calcium absorption and lots of other things okay it's really important uh, rightfully has gotten lots of attention However, it's also important to understand that even that ultraviolet light part of the spectrum has lots of other effects on the body, um, one of which is nitric oxide production. And there are experiments in animals, for example, that um, have our, our vitamin D knockout mice where they can't even produce vitamin D in response to ultraviolet light, and yet they still derive huge health benefits from ultraviolet light exposure. Okay. Um, and, and specifically as far as cardiovascular health, that's probably particularly important, probably also immune health, respiratory function, things like that. Um, so this is a bioactive part of the spectrum. This is light from the sun affecting human biology. Okay. We also have this circadian part of the story, which is uh, primarily about blue light. And you mentioned the seasonal affective disorder. This is a different pathway. This is blue light photons entering our eyeballs, feeding back into a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is where our circadian clock is. And that we, we are now discovering as of the last, especially the last 10 years or so, massively influences almost every system of our body from the function of our brain, sleep and wake cycles and neurochemicals of our brain and um, energy and mood and performance uh, to um, hormonal regulation, uh, hormones like the thyroid hormone, like testosterone, uh, cortisol, melatonin are all, all hugely influenced by this circadian system. Um, and the list goes on. I mean, we, we, there, we're finding clock genes uh, circadian rhythm responsive genes in virtually every tissue of the body. So this circadian system that's primarily influenced by blue light photons entering our eyes, feeding back into our brain, basically is touching almost everything in our body all the way down to the mitochondria in the trillions of cells of our body and influencing how they produce energy and so on. Um, so that's the, the broader context. And what I want people to understand is that lights are like nutrients for the body. It's very much like food. We need, humans have evolved to require certain nutrients in our diet in order to be healthy. We have also evolved to require certain nutrients of light, certain light nutrients in our light diet, you could say, that are necessary for human health that are necessary for our cells to function properly okay and so i've mentioned those two layers the blue light part of the story the ultraviolet light part of the story now another part of this spectrum is red light and near infrared light and for for all intents and purposes they're essentially synonymous they work through the same mechanisms the only real differences are that um, near infrared light penetrates more deeply into our bodies and that it's invisible to the human eye. So we don't perceive it, whereas we do perceive red light. So that's basically the visible part of the spectrum ends with red light. It starts with um, 
with with violet light with the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and then gets into blue and so on goes up to red and then we get out of the visible spectrum into infrared so red and near infrared act on us in the same way uh, through the same mechanisms and what do they do well it turns out they do a lot um, it used to be thought if if you don't mind uh, Peter, can I kind of go on a little bit of explaining some of the mechanisms here? Oh, let's do it. Okay. So it, it was originally thought that red and urine for red light primarily acted on mitochondria to just stimulate energy production. And it turns out they do do that. In fact, on our mitochondria, there is a, a receptor, a photo acceptor called cytochrome C oxidase, and it literally interacts with light photons of red and near infrared light that help stimulate mitochondria to produce more energy. So that's that's one layer of the story that basically these photons of red and near infrared light help our cells produce more energy. Just kind of an interesting thought, you know, it's uh, for, for most people, we're, we're, most people are used to thinking of light in the context of, you know, light and darkness. Light, I turn on a light switch, it helps me see things we're used to thinking of light interacting with cellular mechanisms in plants you know via photosynthesis but we're not used to thinking of light photons penetrating into our cells human cells and stimulating chemical reactions inside of our cells but they do so that's one layer of the story it turns out that that used to be thought as being probably the central aspect of what's going on now it's no longer thought that um there's two other sort of well accepted uh, mechanisms that are going on and then i'll talk about some of the more new, the, the newer ones that have yet to receive like sort of consensus uh, support but i think at least one of them is really important so hormetic stress is the next mechanism which it turns out that like exercise like thermal stress like heat or cold um, and and like hypoxic training or breath holding training um, red and near infrared light act as a transient stressor to our cells they actually stimulate a burst of free radicals at our cells okay that sounds like a bad thing because many people have been taught to believe that oxidants or free radicals are bad and ant antioxidants are good but in fact exercise massively stimulates a burst of of free radicals and we, we know, of course, that this is very good for us. It's not, in fact, bad for us. There's a history there we could talk about if you want to. Um, so what happens when we get this transient spike of free radicals is it actually stimulates adaptive mechanisms in our cells that actually grow our internal antioxidant defense system stronger. Okay? And the free radicals, the reactive oxygen species, also act as a signaling uh, they stimulate a signaling cascade that also stimulates mitochondrial growth and repair and basically makes our cellular energy generators more robust and stronger. Okay, so that's the second mechanism. The third mechanism, probably the most important, according to most uh, scientists in this field, is essentially how it modulates gene expression. So. It, it used to be thought, you know, the central dogma of biology for, for many decades was that genes are the big boss, genes are controlling everything, and everything else in the body takes its orders from genes. We now, of course, know that's not true. There's the whole science of epigenetics. And basically what epigenetics is all about is how signals from the environment are then being communicated back to the nucleus of the cell where the genes are stored and influencing which genes are getting turned on or turned off and, and to what degree. So light is one of those signals that influences gene expression. And we know that red and near infrared light powerfully stimulate gene expression, which genes are getting turned on and off. It's tissue specific. So it's stimulating different gene expressions in different tissues of our body. But the, the, if I can oversimplify this landscape, which could potentially be overly complex and has a list of a hundred and different, you know, molecular mechanisms and, and cellular cascades, uh, you know, with, with fancy names that nobody's ever heard of, the basic gist of what's going on is that it's stimulating the, uh, it's stimulating genes that are involved with growth and repair. 
Okay. And especially growth factors of various kinds. So in the brain, it stimulates nerve growth factor and brain derived neuro neurotrophic factor. Um, in the muscles, it stimulates IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, to help stimulate growth and repair of those tissues, and, and does so with specific growth factors in virtually every other tissues. It's been studied in bones, it's been studied in tendons and with fibroblasts, and, and skin with fibroblasts, and collagen production. It's been studied in uh, thyroid function and helping to stimulate thyroid regrowth. Um, and, re and, and, and simultaneous to that, it tends to reduce inflammation. So it's reducing genes involved with that are pro-inflammatory and stimulating growth and repair functions. That's the, the, the sort of primary function, if you will, of red and near infrared light is it stimulates growth and repair. Okay, the, the other two mechanisms that I'll briefly mention here are one has to do with what's called easy water or the fourth phase of water that has been a theory promoted by or a hypothesis promoted by uh, most famously by Gerald Pollack, but many other scientists have been involved in this. And um, the, the basic idea is that light influences the viscosity of water and some of the other chemicals properties of water. And uh, there's some evidence to show that this may influence cellular function. Um, the last one I'll mention, which I think is going to turn out to be, if, if I can make a prediction, I think it's going to turn out to be really important in human physiology and, and the story of human health, has to do with melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone that we all know of that people think of sleep. And uh, it's, it's most famously known for being produced by the pineal gland in the brain, um, primarily at nighttime. And this pineal gland melatonin then goes into the bloodstream and is, is generally supportive of sleep and restoration functions during sleep. And that's an, certainly an important layer of the story of melatonin. What, what, what has only recently been uncovered is that melatonin actually, it turns out, isn't only produced in the pineal gland. It's also produced in virtually all of the cells of our body. And this is what's called mitochondrial derived melatonin or uh, non pineal melatonin or um, intracellular melatonin. So basically, melatonin is an antioxidant that evolved millions of years ago in much simpler organisms. It's ubiquitous through the animal world and the plant world, actually. And it evolved, it looks like, primarily because it's a very, very potent, the most potent mitochondrial antioxidant. It really strongly protects our mitochondria. It turns out that it's so important for protecting mitochondria that mitochondria actually evolved to produce their own supply of it. And the amount that our mitochondria produce in the trillions of cells of our body actually dwarfs by orders of magnitude dwarfs the amount produced by our pineal gland each day. It turns out that, and this is the last little bit, it turns out that this melatonin um, actually is produced by our mitochondria in very large amounts in response to red and near infrared light exposure. So it seems to be heavily involved in the sort of antioxidant reserve capacity of our cells and helping our cells uh, neutralize stress and prevent damage from stress, and especially at the mitochondrial level. And it seems, my sort of um, layman's way of describing this, is it seems that red and near infrared light help recharge that system to help um, basically make the cell increase the cells buffering capacity to help neutralize and prevent damage that might occur, otherwise occur with stress. So that's sort of the overview of uh, how I best how I understand the different mechanisms of how this works.